A lot of people think that sleep apnea and other sleeping problems are genetic. And just because your parents had it, that means you are bound to get it. But that is completely wrong. And this is even things that doctors and other medical professionals think. And this is something that really makes me upset because I'm a dentist. And in dental school, we are trained to look for different signs of sleep apnea or other sleeping problems. And I also have a lot of friends who finished medical school and are now practicing medicine, but still, in all of these scenarios, no one is taught the root cause of sleep apnea or other sleeping issues. And when I was in school studying, I thought this was something we just didn't know yet or we were never gonna figure out. Until I was done with dental school and then I started taking additional coursework outside of school. That's when I started realizing there are some simple things you can start doing now to either prevent you from getting sleep apnea or even fix sleep apnea or at least make your sleep apnea symptoms better. And these are things that do not involve a CPAP machine or any sort of surgery. Now some of these tips will involve actually strengthening your jaw muscles and different exercises you can do throughout the day, also involving your tongue. And also one of the biggest things is learning how to use your nose properly to breathe. Now what exactly is sleep apnea? Well, there's two different types of sleep apnea. One is an obstructive type and the other one is called central sleep apnea. Both of these involve multiple bouts of suffocation while you are sleeping. So that means that while you're asleep at night, multiple times throughout the night you are suffocating or gasping for air or not being able to get as much oxygen into your lungs. Now this can have real problems because first of all, you're not gonna be getting a full sleep cycle. You're never gonna be able to get that deep restorative sleep that you desperately need because throughout the night you're just gasping for air and you're just basically trying to fight for survival. But also this is gonna cause a lot of issues with the rest of your body. This is gonna to lead to an overactive sympathetic nervous system. This is going to lead to a lot of oxidative stress. And all of these things can contribute to a whole list of other diseases like cancer, heart disease, and so on. Now most of the cases of sleep apnea involve that obstructive type that I was talking about. So I'm only gonna focus on that one. But that is basically, as the name sounds, some sort of obstruction in your airway. So as you're breathing, something is constricted or blocking that air from getting to your lungs. Now this can be a lot of different things. For example, if you are obese or overweight or even bodybuilders who have very thick necks, that's gonna constrict that airflow. It's gonna constrict those tubes that go into your lungs. But the thing is that sleep apnea doesn't just affect people who are overweight. Even people who are really skinny can get very severe sleep apnea. And that's because sometimes the shape of your jaw will be so constricted that it's also gonna block air from getting into your lungs. Either that or sometimes your tongue can fall back and block your breathing, or sometimes your tonsils can be super big. There's a lot of things that can contribute to that airway being compromised. Now, when you listen to that, you might think, well, it's gotta be something genetic, right? Because how else am I gonna control how my jaw grows? Well, surprisingly, the way that our jaws grow is not something that's genetic. And we have proof of that. If you look at our ancestors and you look at any skull from over a thousand years old, you will see that all of these skulls and all of these jaws will be very big and very wide and very spacious. And they'll be so spacious that all of their teeth will come in in the right place and they won't be crooked. All of our ancestors, surprisingly, did not need any orthodontics. They all had magically straight teeth. They were so straight that also their wisdom teeth came in in the right place. How many times have you heard that you need to get your wisdom teeth taken out? Or have you heard a friend or a family member that needed to get a wisdom teeth surgery to get their wisdom teeth taken out? Or how many people do you know that needed braces to fix their misaligned teeth? Chances are it is a lot of people because even the patients that I see, it's really hard to find people that have perfectly straight teeth. But somehow that is how our ancestors' teeth were. Even a guy named Richard Klein, who has done a ton of research on our early human fossils and on anthropology, has said that he has never seen an early human skull with crooked teeth. It really wasn't until recently where our jaws started getting smaller and smaller. And if you look back, you'll see that this change in our jaws started rapidly happening after industrialization. And what anthropologists have found is that these rapid changes in our jaws really only happened in the last 150 years. And this has been studied many times. For example, another person that studied this is 
a dental anthropologist named Robert Coruccini. And he even said that increases in malocclusion have accelerated during the last 150 years in technologically advanced communities after modest changes for 6,000 years. So what that means is for 6,000 years, we noticed very moderate, mild changes as the course of our evolution was going on. But in the last 150 years, we noticed some very drastic changes. So just to be blunt, there is absolutely no way that evolution can work that quickly where we see these very drastic changes in just 150 years. So what that means is it has to be a change in our environment. So something changed in our environment around us or something that we were doing that caused these changes in our jaws and also contributed to a lot of different diseases like sleep apnea. So what are those changes? Well, it comes down to three specific things. The first and the biggest one is a change in our diets. And a lot of our foods have become softer and softer that do not require as much chewing. And the second thing is a change in our breathing. Now, instead of using our nose to breathe as much, people have started relying on their mouth more and more. And that led to their mouth hanging open instead of being closed majority of the time. And the third thing was moving indoors and not living outside in the wilderness anymore. Now I'm really going to focus on those first two things because I'm not going to expect everyone to go live in the jungles again because I certainly will not be doing that. But basically what happened after industrialization is our foods became a lot more and more processed. Our foods became a lot softer. We started removing a lot of the fiber from our food and we can even see now like baby foods for example. They're really mushy and soft. They don't really require any chewing at all. But if you look at history and you look at the diets that our ancestors used to eat, those foods required a ton of chewing. Our ancestors actually used to chew about four hours a day. Imagine spending four hours out of your day chewing your food. You would probably go crazy. But now we hardly spend any time chewing. Like I can scarf down my dinner in about five minutes if I'm being very slow and patient. But also what we see now is pretty much everyone has crooked teeth. Almost everyone has to get their wisdom teeth taken out just because it's something that's normal. Well, I'm here to tell you that it is not normal to have crooked teeth and it's not normal to have to get your wisdom teeth taken out because why would our bodies be designed to have something come in that causes problems 100% of the time and always needs a surgery to come out. If you look back at our ancestors who spent a lot of each day actually chewing their food and developing their jaw muscles, that actually stimulated the stem cells in their jaws to start growing. So the more they use your jaws to actually chew your food, especially as those jaws were developing, the bigger your jaws grew. And what anthropologists have found is because of this change in our diets, which led to smaller and smaller jaws, this led to us becoming more and more mouth breathers and also us having our mouths hanging open more and more throughout the day. Now this leads to part two of the problem because normally if someone's jaw is developing spacious and wide like it's supposed to, then normally at rest, that person is gonna have their mouth closed and they're gonna normally be breathing through their nose. And what happens when their mouth is normally closed like that is their tongue is gonna be resting against the roof of their mouth. Or in other words, that tongue is gonna be resting against their palate. And simply having that tongue resting against that palate for a lot of time throughout the day is also gonna further enforce those stem cells to widen because that tongue is going to cause that palate to grow in the shape of its tongue. So your palate's gonna grow U-shaped just like your tongue and it's gonna grow wider and forward. But now instead, when people have their mouths hanging open, their tongue is never touching the roof of their mouth. Instead, they're breathing through their mouth and their mouths are open. So now that palate is gonna stay constricted because their cheeks are gonna keep everything constricted and they're not gonna have any reinforcement to make it wider. This is why we have so many kids that need to go to an orthodontist and get those things called expanders. Those expanders are those super annoying things that go in the roof of their mouth and you have to turn it every day just a little bit and over time it starts to widen that palate more and more. And now what we're finding is a lot of kids have these tonsil and adenoid infections where their tonsils grow super large and their adenoids grow super big and this further blocks that air from getting into their lungs. What you'll find out, and I'm gonna get into this, is the mouth breathing and all these other changes actually cause that change in your tonsils and cause those tonsil and adenoid infections. And now what we're left with is we have a lot of kids 
who have very severe snoring and a lot of kids even have very severe sleep apnea right now and a lot of adults have sleep apnea that they just don't know about and a lot of adults are simply snoring every single night and they're getting terrible sleep and they just think that it's normal for them to be chronically sleep deprived. Now the thing is that sleep apnea and other sleeping problems like this will probably not be fixed by genetics or natural selection or anything like that. Because sleep apnea is not something that actually affects our reproduction. Or in other words, people usually don't realize they have sleep apnea until after they have kids. And even if they do realize they have sleep apnea, it's not really going to affect their reproduction at all. So that's why the only thing you can do is actually focus on how to prevent sleep apnea and how to potentially fix sleep apnea if you already have it. And using the knowledge that we know how we got here in the first place is going to help a lot. Now depending on whether you're an adult or a child, we're going to approach how to fix or even prevent sleep apnea a little differently. So I'm going to start by talking about a child. The first way to prevent having sleep apnea in a baby is to make sure that that baby is breastfeeding as long as possible. What our studies are showing is the longer period of time that a baby is breastfeeding, the less crooked teeth that they will have. And the reason for that is breastfeeding will encourage that baby's tongue to be up against the roof of their mouth. And that baby will actually have to work to get that breast milk out. As opposed to drinking out of a sippy cup, that sippy cup will actually push that tongue down and do the opposite that we want. When that tongue is up against the roof of the mouth, that's going to help that jaw expand and give more room for that baby's teeth to come in in the right place. And in turn, also make room for that baby to be able to breathe normally and prevent having sleep apnea. And the second thing is to stop feeding your kids mushy foods. We know from history and we know from studies that babies are able to feed themselves solid foods. So I'd recommend starting at the age of six months to make sure that that baby is eating solid foods. I would avoid all the store brand Gerber's and mushy foods that are out there right now because those are actually doing the opposite of what we want. Obviously, it would be a good idea to have a parent or a guardian supervising that baby as they're eating. But things like celery, apples, pears, or carrots, all of these things are going to be much better than those mushy foods that we have right now that are not doing anything for their jaw development. Instead, when we actually get those babies to start chewing foods earlier on, this is going to be really crucial for their jaw development growing forward. Now, the other thing that you want to enforce is chewing with good oral posture. Now, this is something that a lot of adults can benefit from as well. That's basically just going to be making sure you're chewing with your mouth closed. And what you'll find is that can actually be sometimes harder than you think. Sometimes when you're chewing on a tough piece of meat or something, you want to keep your mouth open as you're chewing it. But you want to make sure you keep your lips closed because this will also help engage your jaw muscles and also help engage those stem cells, especially in that jaw that's developing to start growing. And also you want to make sure you have good oral posture in general. And again, this is something that adults can practice as well. So the perfect mouth posture will be your lips closed with your teeth slightly touching and your tongue against the roof of your mouth. This is how you want to train yourself to be at all times of rest. So for a kid, this is going to be a lot easier because if you train a child to start being like this at all times, they're going to be way more likely to develop these habits later on in life. As opposed to if you're a 30 year old or a 40 year old watching this, it's going to be a lot harder to start transitioning to this posture. It's still possible, but it's going to be harder. A lot of people like to call this perfect oral posture different names. One really popular one is called mewing. And one reason I actually got that name is because a guy named Dr. Mew actually developed something called orthotropics, where part of it actually involves having proper oral or proper mouth posture. Now, it's also a good idea to have good posture in general. So not just your mouth posture, now the rest of your body as well. Because what we've also seen is people who have a head forward posture or where their head is tilted forward all the time, that's also associated with people that have crooked teeth. Now part of the reason for that could be that your tongue is actually connected to your neck muscles. And if your tongue is always against the floor of your mouth or the bottom of your mouth and your jaw is always hanging open, that's going to pull your head forward. And another reason for that is because right now when your head is up straight, your head weighs about 12 pounds. For every inch that your head falls forward, that adds a whole 10 pounds. So if your head is forward 3 inches, that's going to add 42 pounds of strain on your neck and shoulders compared to just having a normal 12 pound head. So having a proper mouth posture where your lips are closed and your tongue is against the roof of your mouth is going to help 
keep your head back because your jaw is not going to be pulling your head forward. Now, another thing you can try as a child is growing a little older, and even an adult can try this, is chewing gum. Now, a lot of times in different cultures, chewing gum is frowned upon or seen as a bad thing, but chewing gum is a great way to actually engage your jaw muscles. Now, when you're chewing your gum, you want to make sure you focus on a couple of things. The first one is you want to chew about 30 minutes a day. I know that seems like a long time, but you'll notice that whenever you're chewing gum, you can go a lot longer than 30 minutes without realizing it. You also want to make sure that you're chewing evenly on both sides. You don't want to just develop one side of your jaw muscles and neglect the other side. And we have studies actually showing that chewing gum can actually improve your cognitive performance. Now, obviously, when you're looking for chewing gum, you want to find one that's completely sugar-free. My favorite ingredient is xylitol, because studies have actually shown that xylitol can actually help prevent you from getting new cavities. And again, whenever you're chewing this gum or having a child chew this gum, you want to make sure that they have that correct oral posture. So make sure they don't chew with their mouth open. Now, the last tip I have to prevent sleep apnea in a child or even an adult is to make sure that you're focusing on nose breathing at all times. That is only using your nose to breathe instead of your mouth. If you look back at our ancestors, at all times, they would be using their nose to breathe, even when they were hunting or running for extended periods of times. Now, I want you to imagine going outside and running one mile without opening your mouth at all. Seems pretty difficult, right? But breathing through our nose gives so many benefits that our mouth simply does not give. One of the biggest things is our nose actually filters out a lot of the air and the dust and particles, and also 99% of viruses and bacteria. So that means that people who regularly breathe through their nose are going to be way less likely to get sick than someone who is a mouth breather. A lot of times I hear people complaining that they have allergies or they have a really stuffy nose and they cannot breathe through their nose in the first place. Well, I want you to think about this for a second. What is the reason that you cannot breathe through your nose in the first place? Most likely, it is because you were originally a mouth breather in the first place and that actually contributed to that stuffy nose. So training yourself to start breathing through your nose is going to really help you in the long run and prevent those stuffy noses and also prevent a lot of those allergies. So one simple trick you can do to start breathing through your nose better is called a nose unblocking exercise. I actually made more videos on this. I'm going to put a link in the description below where I go more into detail on it, but I'm going to give you a little demonstration how to do it right now. Basically, it involves taking a normal inhale and exhale out through your nose. So you can hold your mouth and go. And after that exhale, you want to hold your nose and hold your mouth and start bobbing your head back and forth as long as you can until you have a medium to strong urge to breathe. So it's going to look kind of like this. Basically what that's doing is it's increasing the circulation in your nose and it's also building up CO2 or a molecule called carbon dioxide. And what that ends up doing is it starts opening up and dilating those nasal passages. Because first of all, CO2 is also a vasodilator. So it's going to start dilating all those blood vessels. And the second thing is once your body senses that there's more CO2 building up, it's going to put a signal to your nose to stop producing as much mucus. So I want you to do this for six sets. So after you do one round of this, you're going to want to recover by just breathing through your nose for about one minute. So after I'm done bobbing my head, I'm just going to relax by breathing through my nose for one minute. And you don't want to be breathing super hard. Just breathe normally for that one minute and then repeat that exercise a total of six times. Now, you can also do this exercise by instead of bobbing your head, you can start walking. So if you're walking on a track, just walk as many paces as you can, again, until you have that medium to strong urge to breathe and then you recover by breathing through your nose. You can do this either if you're a child or an adult. Either way, this is really going to help you improve your breathing. Now, some other things you can try are if you have allergies, taking an allergy pill before you do this exercise and also cleaning out your nose before you start this as well. So you can put like a saline rinse in your nose. One really popular one is called the Neil Med sinus rinse and that'll end up going in each nostril just to help clean out that nose before you start doing this exercise. And you can also try using a nasal decongestant spray, which is a spray that goes in each nostril and helps open up your nose a little bit so you can do this exercise properly. Once you're doing this exercise, you want to make sure you do not open your mouth up in the middle of it or afterwards, because if you start using your mouth again, it can quickly clog up that nose again. You can do this exercise as many times as you want throughout the day and 
what you'll find is the more you do this, eventually you might not have to do it as much as you start getting better and better at breathing through your nose. I think one of the best times to do this is right before you go to sleep because after you're done, you can try my last tip on how to help breathing through your nose, which is a mouth tape. That's simply putting a medical grade tape over your nose right before you go to sleep. And that's gonna help encourage you to keep breathing through your nose all night long. My favorite tape to use is called a 3M Micropore Paper Tape. It's really cheap and it's really easy to use. You just rip off a piece and tape it over your mouth and then it'll help encourage you to breathe through your nose all night long. Now, if you're an adult and you're watching this, just know it's gonna be a lot harder to fix your jaw structure and a lot harder to make your jaw wider without getting any sort of device or surgery. But there are still a ton of benefits you can get from improving your posture and improving your breathing specifically through your nose. We have a lot of studies on using a mouth tape and a nasal strip, which is basically a strip that goes over your nose and helps dilate your nasal passages a little bit. You can also use a nasal dilator that is basically something that goes inside of your nose that helps dilate your nasal passages a little bit. We also have a lot of studies on the nasal decongestant spray I was talking about. And all of these things, even if you don't improve your jaw structure at all, it can still help prevent sleep apnea, even fix sleep apnea in some cases, or at least make the sleep apnea less severe. Now, just because we have proven ways to actually prevent sleep apnea or actually fix it in some cases, there's still some times that you have to see a specialist and get some sort of surgery or some sort of device made. Now, the ideal way of doing this would be to get a baseline sleep study. So before you do anything, get a sleep study, and then you can try doing the methods that I talked about, like the mouth tape, the nasal dilator, and all the other nose unblocking exercises and the posture techniques, and then get another sleep study a couple weeks after doing those things that I talked about, and see if there's any changes in your sleep performance. If you notice that you still have very severe sleep apnea after all these changes, then I would say it's time to go to the next step and get a device made. So try to get a CPAP machine. That's probably the first line of defense. There's also some specific dental devices you can get made that actually advance your jaw forward and can actually open up your airway without putting that CPAP machine on. You can probably look into that by going to any dentist and they may either refer you or actually treat you themselves. The absolute last resort when nothing else is working is to get a surgery done where you actually advance your jaw forward. That can be uh, really hard to recover from, it can be a little painful, but if everything else fails, that is also an option. But the other thing with that surgery is there's a lot of surgeons that are going away from doing that as well because a lot of them don't wanna take on the risks and they just don't get as much reward from it than seeing a normal, typical patient. But there are still some surgeons that are doing it. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about is signs that a child will have sleep apnea in the first place. A lot of times we find it hard to believe that a child can possibly have sleep apnea. Usually we think of sleep apnea as a disease that affects someone who's in their 60s and overweight and snoring a lot and just very obvious signs of sleep apnea. But you'll be surprised that a lot of children nowadays are having signs of sleep apnea and a lot of children actually have sleep apnea. So there's a lot of signs that a dentist specifically will look at that will show signs of sleep apnea or something called sleep disordered breathing or some other sleeping condition. First of all, if a child is grinding their teeth in their sleep, that is a really bad sign. This is one of the first things I check when I'm doing my dental exam on a child. If I see that those front teeth are really worn down and flat, and if a parent tells me that they hear them all night long grinding their teeth back and forth in their sleep, this is a huge indication that there is some breathing issue involved. Because a natural response for a child when their breathing is cut off when they're sleeping is to start grinding their teeth. And we have studies to prove that. So if you have a child and you see that that child is grinding their teeth in their sleep, and you can hear them in the next room over, I would advise you to go to either a dentist right away or an ENT, an ear, nose, and throat doctor right away to get an airway examination. And also another bad sign with a child is if they are snoring. A lot of times we think it's super cute when we see a little baby or a little child sleeping and we hear them snoring. And the reason we think it's cute is because, well, first of all, it is cute, but second of all, we think snoring is normal. But from all the other things I've been talking about, we know that snoring is absolutely not normal. 
Normal breathing is something that we cannot hear. Normal breathing is silent breathing, in and out through our nose. If we see a child with their mouth open and they are snoring, that is another huge problem and another indication that they have either sleep apnea or some sort of sleep disordered breathing. And sometimes there are more subtle signs that we don't really pay attention to. Like if they go to sleep and they appear to be sleeping normally, but they are really restless in bed and the next day their sheets are kind of all over the place, that's another bad sign and I would definitely get that one checked out as well. Another bad sign is if they have very large tonsils and adenoids. This is another thing that I check in my routine dental exam when I'm seeing kids. I'll have them open their mouth and say, ah, and I'll check their tonsils and their adenoids. If I see really large inflamed tonsils, then this might be another indication that they have a sleeping issue. And the reason is that this is all related. And breathing issues, and specifically mouth breathing, can cause issues like enlarged tonsils and adenoids. And also having these large tonsils and adenoids can be another contributor to sleep apnea. Even Dr. Christian Guillemineau, who is a sleep apnea expert, believes that mouth breathing will cause these large tonsils and adenoids. A lot of people wonder whether having these large tonsils and adenoids is what causes them to become a mouth breather, but we have evidence that it's actually the other way around. One reason is when people get their tonsils and adenoids removed, it is more of a temporary fix. So a lot of times children will go get their tonsils and adenoids removed whenever they go see an ENT because they find that they have very severe sleep apnea and they wanna open up their airway as much as possible. So they remove those tonsils and adenoids. Well, what we know is that will work very well for a short period of time. For a lot of time, we did not want to do any long-term studies on tonsils and adenoid removal because we just thought it wasn't necessary. And I don't really blame them because in the first few months and first year after that tonsil and adenoid removal, we saw huge improvements and there's no sign of anything getting worse. So why would you keep doing studies for years on end? But luckily now we have more long-term research on removing tonsils and adenoids. And specifically, we have research that follows up three years and beyond. And we find that these tonsil and adenoid removals are not as successful. And these kids, again, are having these same issues of sleep apnea or some disordered breathing when they're sleeping. So what you gotta understand is, if you are getting your tonsils and adenoids removed in your child, just know that this is a temporary fix. And the reason is, this is not fixing the cause of the problem. And the cause of the problem, again, is mouth breathing. And I talked a lot about why this is the case in the first place in some of my other videos. So I'm putting a link in the description below where you can learn more about that. But in a nutshell, when you're a mouth breather, you're way more likely to get sick versus when you are a nose breather. When you're a nose breather and you're breathing properly, you're gonna be a lot less likely to get sick and you're gonna be a lot less likely to get those tonsil and adenoid infections and you're gonna be a lot less likely to have sleep apnea. So the biggest thing you can do for your child is to make sure that they are breathing through their nose. Now the last sign that a child has sleep apnea or some sort of sleeping disorder is they're showing symptoms of ADHD. Surprisingly, ADHD has the same symptoms as someone who is chronically tired or sleep deprived. If you look at the list of symptoms of ADHD and you look at the list of symptoms of someone who was tired, they're practically the same. And the reason is that we have a lot of evidence that a lot of the cases of ADHD are going misdiagnosed. I'm not saying all the cases are fake, but a vast majority of them can be attributable to not sleeping good. For example, in one study, they took 105 kids that were scheduled to get their tonsils and adenoids removed. But before they got their tonsils and adenoids removed, they had two things done. They had a sleep study, and they also got evaluated for ADHD by a psychiatrist. They found that 22 of those kids had ADHD. And after the surgery, they went back to the psychiatrist and got re-evaluated. And they found that after one full year, only half of those kids still had ADHD. And just so you know, based on the definition of ADHD, that is impossible. It is impossible to lose your ADHD after just one year because ADHD involves neurologic damage to the brain. So you're telling me that after just one year, 
of removing your tonsils and adenoids, that half of these kids no longer had ADHD. The thing is, they never had ADHD in the first place. They were just sleep deprived. Now again, I'm not saying that all cases of ADHD are fake, but if your child got diagnosed with ADHD, I would be very suspicious of some sort of sleeping problem first. Caffeine is one of the most widely used and abused drugs in the world. And most people think since caffeine is a stimulant, that it is therefore a solution to a lot of their sleep problems and to them feeling chronically tired. But what if I told you that your need for caffeine is a sign that you are not sleeping well